Welcome to our study today, and thank you for joining us. If you have a Bible with you, I'd invite you to go ahead and open it up to Acts chapter 2, and we'll be looking there in just a few moments. I know so many of us are just tired of talking about and hearing about quarantine and coronavirus, and I certainly don't want to add to that frustration, but we are going to talk a little bit more about um, you know, what we're going through right now and, and our response to it. The title of our lesson today is going to be Questions for the Quarantined. And I know that sounds like we're going to talk about coronavirus, but I, I hope that that's not the focus of our study. Rather, what I really want to do is, is give us some probing questions that, especially for Christians, we can ask ourselves that will be helpful to, to sort of examine how we're responding. Are we being passive in our response or are we being uh, hopefully active in our response? Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunities, and I want us to see what those opportunities are and see uh, how we can be effective in this particular moment. Uh, there can be a lot of helplessness, uh, a lot of feeling of, of helplessness that we, we're not able to do what we want to do. But I think for Christians, there are some things that we especially can continue to do even in the middle uh, of a very difficult situation. And so uh, let's look at some of those questions, and I hope that they'll be helpful to you as we go through asking those to ourselves, doing a little bit of self-examination and maybe offering sort of a, a transition of thought where our focus is so much on, on the, um, the chaos in the world, sort of shift our focus over onto some more stable thoughts. Well, the first question uh, that we'll begin with today is, what does church mean? What is church? Um, the very word church means assembly, and I don't want to I don't want to get involved in any sort of um, sort of extreme reactions right now. Uh, there are always um, various sides of extremes that people uh, talk on and and sort of um, meander off into. And a crisis is a perfect moment. It's kind of a perfect storm for that, where where people really get out into the extremes when they're talking about any particular. Um, uh, crisis or chaos situation. So uh, I, I want to be very careful to avoid that. And particularly when we're talking about the assembly, I don't want to leave any impression that I think the assembly is unimportant. I think there are some people who are using that kind of language now. They're, they're talking about, well, now we're figuring out that the church never really was the assembly, that that's, that that's not... Uh, primarily, that's not the focus of who we are, uh, and and really uh, worship is more even about what happens outside of the four walls of the assembly. Well, look, I, I think that we can talk about what happens outside the assembly without diminishing the importance of getting together. Uh, it's, it's a very clearly important thing throughout scriptures. There in Acts chapter 2, you see from the very inception of the church, here Here's the, the very beginning of the church, literally. On the day of Pentecost, uh, 3,000 people are brought to Christ. And, and very quickly after that, in verse 42, we see uh, some of what they're engaging in. They're continuing, it says, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And so here they are, studying together, uh, breaking bread, the Lord's Supper together, they're praying together, uh, and we would con we continue to see this pattern as we uh, go on through the rest of the book of Acts and, and on into uh, the letters to the various churches that have already been established. Uh, there's some important things that come from the assembly, and, and in the first century, maybe even more important. Um, in Colossians chapter 4, and in verse 16, the Apostle Paul, he writes as he's concluding his letter to the Colossians, he tells them uh, to send their letter over to the church or the assembly in Laodicea so they, they can see that letter and, and to read the letter from Laodicea among themselves. Can you imagine in the first century, if you, if you didn't um, take seriously the importance of assembling, you would miss out on hearing the revelation that Paul was sending out at that time. Now, I know we have Bibles now in our homes, and, and we don't 
we don't have to assemble uh, in order to hear the scripture scriptures read. Um, but I just want to see that that is absolutely the pattern. And not only that, of course, but in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, we're given that imperative not to forsake. So in no way do I want to diminish the need to assemble together. And as soon as we are able to assemble back together here at Pepper Road, not only will we do that, but I think there will be a, a renewed, I hope, a renewed appreciation uh, for that privilege that we have to assemble together. But in this moment, in this time where uh, we at Pepper Road, at least, and I know many of you uh, are not able to assemble right now, uh, maybe there are government mandates that we're trying to comply with, but also with the very uh, the very motive of those mandates in order to keep each other safe. And I appreciate those motivations. So what are we to do while we're not assembling? How are we to think about church when that is certainly a central part, by, the, by very definition, the assembly, and we're not able to assemble? Well, I think that there are a few things to keep in mind. Number one, looking over there at Hebrews chapter 10, that passage we referenced just a moment ago, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 24 and 25, let's, let's look at that. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, it says there, Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, just think through that for just a moment. Let's, let's take out the assembly. That's what's happened to us. Let's take out the assembly and let's read back through that. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I want to suggest to you that when you take the assembly out of that passage, there's some things that are left. There's, some, there's still work to do. Now, the assembly is a particularly um, effective way to do that, but it isn't the only way. And so when the assembly is removed, one of the things that we're trying to do right now is provide opportunities to still accomplish the very purpose of the assembly. Now, I don't think we can accomplish it as effectively as when we come together, uh, but nevertheless, we can still try to, to fulfill those roles uh, that are being, uh, that we're missing right now as we're not able to assemble together. And so that's one thought is just, is just still try to provide for those, those growth opportunities and particularly the together growth opportunities. We live in a time where we can be very thankful that we're able to stay in communication, able to continue to build one another up. But another thing uh, along those lines is it's, it's an opportunity for us to kind of evaluate our relationships. Uh, when we are separated from the assembly, um, think right now about what that means uh, uh, with regards to your relationships toward the people that you normally would be assembling with. When you take away that, that time that we have together on the first day of the week and, and hear our midweek study being on Wednesdays, and so we see those people um, a few times a week and spend a few hours in those assemblies. Once we leave those assemblies, where is the relationship? Is there a relationship outside of those four walls? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, the, it may be a, a strange passage to bring into a discussion about fellowship. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is talking about disfellowship or, or removing of that fellowship. And the reason in 1 Corinthians 5 for that, uh, if you're familiar, you, you know the story there, but, but there's a man who uh, is engaged in immorality and uh, particularly egregious immorality. And so Paul tells them to separate themselves as a congregation from that particular individual. And he says in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, not even to eat with such one. That's how far you take the removal of the fellowship. Well, here's, here's what I want you to consider. It's the reason I'm bringing that passage into this particular discussion. Take a moment this week and, and look at the, the membership in your congregation and uh, maybe use a directory or the website or whatever and go down through the list of names. I, I know some people who have gone to church with other, uh, with their brothers and sisters for years, 
and don't even know what their names are, much less in anything else about them. There's no relationship there whatsoever. And when the assembly is taken away, really there's nothing else there. That's the only time they get together. It's the only time they would ever uh, have a conversation, check in on each other, uh, even exchange pleasantries. It, it, this should not be. And what 1 Corinthians 5 has to do about uh, with that is that Paul says the, the means of affecting, the means of getting through to a brother is to take away something precious, to take away the fellowship that says we, we are in good standing and we, are, we have a, a closeness and a, um, and a something, a, a relationship that is desirable. But what, what happens if, if a brother strays and we say, I'm withdrawing my fellowship, and all that means is, it, it just means it's a, it's a matter of semantics. There is no ceasing of a relationship because it wasn't one to begin with. Maybe all it means is we don't see them on Sundays and Wednesdays anymore. And, and very likely, uh, if, if disfellowship is, is where we're at, that probably had already been taken away because maybe they weren't assembling in the first place. Brethren, it ought to be that we are developing the kinds of relationships that if somebody walked away from the Lord, that relationship would be one of the things that would keep them from so easily doing that. And right now, we have a chance to, to sort of examine and see if we take away the assembly, is there anything left? And if there are people on that list where that is all you got, then maybe there's an opportunity for us to reach out at this time and to build more of a relationship among God's people than just the assembly. There's another thing that I would uh, press on this question, and that is the thought of how important each of us are to the body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it uses that kind of imagery there, the idea of a body, and, and, and that no one body part can say to another body part, I don't need you. Every part is necessary, and every part is uh, precious and ought to be precious to the rest of the body. This one is difficult for me. Right now, we're all experience, experiencing um, a, um, a quarantine that a lot of people experience every day. And when this crisis is over, they still won't be leaving their homes, or at least not frequently. A lot of people have health problems that keep them from maybe even getting out of the bed very often, much less able to get to the assembly. Some people are taking care of others who uh, are in such difficult uh, health situations. And so they're very rarely able to assemble. They, they certainly are not as free as the rest of us to come each and every time uh, God's people assemble. One of the things that I've recognized is how little I have appreciated those people who are faithful to God and are devoted to God, want to be with God's people and simply are not able because that's all of us right now. Certainly at Pepper Road, that's all of us. And so what have I done to try to help them? I'm afraid sometimes we've, we've shied away from some of the ways that maybe we could reach out and offer them um, some sort of inclusion and some sort of um, uh, encouragement we scrambled here at Pepper Road to begin to get material online. I scrambled. It's something that I've wanted to do, but not something I've really pursued with a lot of energy. And all of a sudden, uh, it, it became top priority. Maybe it should have been a priority before now. Because we have brothers and sisters who are needing uh, their, their fellowship, who are needing their brothers and sisters each and every week. They're a part of this body. And they're part of this body that maybe we have not paid enough attention to. And so I hope, I hope that what I'm seeing right now with the, the tremendous increase of um, 
material and so forth and and opportunities to interact with each other uh, online that are being put out by so many brethren, so many congregations, that that won't stop. And I don't mean, I, I think one thing that, that I've done, I've been worried from time to time that maybe, maybe if we stream our services or, or maybe if we uh, put a sermon like this uh, on uh, YouTube or Facebook, that that's going to encourage lazy people to stay home. It may. It may. Um, but I think I've worried more about encouraging or providing something that, uh, providing a, an out, let's say, to a, a lazy brother or sister, that it's caused me to ignore the faithful brother or sister. And I think I'm going to focus more on providing for that faithful brother or sister than I'm going to worry about what, what that might do to a person who's not committed anyway. And so I appreciate it. It's, it's given me a chance to think more about what everybody, what every part plays, what every, uh, the preciousness of every part of the body here at Pepper Road. So that's one question. What is church? And it's given, giving us some opportunities to think about that, how engaged we are uh, with the, the local churches that we're a part of. Another question that I want to ask is, what or, or where is your treasure? Um, we talk a lot about this. It's a passage that, that comes up frequently uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 6. But really, it's, it's come home in a way that it rarely does, especially in our country. In fact, um, in many ways, the, um, the economy is, is taking one of the more drastic hits, maybe more drastic than it ever has in the history of our country. And so what do we do with that? One brother uh, posted recently, I can't remember who it was, I wish I could, but he, he posted, maybe it was on Facebook, and he said, you know, moths and rust are sure doing a number on my earthly treasures right now. No doubt. I will say, he went on to say, good thing my treasure is not here on earth. And that's, of course, Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus makes that point there. Matthew chapter 6 and beginning in verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, as I think about that idea of building up treasure in heaven, we, we talk about it, um, we preach about it, and what, what's being given to us now is a chance to sort of practice what we preach. Uh, we say all the time, it doesn't matter. You know, I don't care what happens to my 401k. I don't care if, if, if I lose all my retirement so long as I get to heaven. Well, brethren, there's people that have lost all their retirement. Now what? I, I hope that, that we're remembering those things that we've preached, those things that maybe have become cliche. They're not cliche anymore. They're real. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and in verse 6, Paul says, But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Now, I don't know uh, that anyone watching this is down to food and covering, in fact, if you're watching this, you probably, well, you almost certainly have more than that because you, you're, you have a way to watch this. We're a very prosperous nation. And even if we lose a great deal, we are, we are far beyond uh, what most people would consider comfort. Nevertheless, we're losing stuff. One way or another, all of us are losing time and opportunities. We're losing things that we love. Uh, we're losing sports, we're losing uh, concerts, we're losing the ability to just go to the store whenever we want. So many things that we have taken for granted are, are gone, and how are we responding to that? I hope, I hope that we're responding with some contentment. We're responding like people whose real treasure uh, is somewhere else entirely. You know, when you, when you think about losses and gains, Think about where we are right now. A lot of calls for frustration. We talked some about that 
in our lesson last week. Maybe you're frustrated particularly because you think some of this is unnecessary, that it's being handled poorly, either either the healthcare aspect or the economic aspect, that something's being handled poorly and could could be better. And therefore, it's it, it, it's not even just the loss, it's the frustration of its it, we don't we shouldn't have to go through this. Well, you and I aren't making those decisions, and the fact is we are going through this. And the question is not a matter of, of what are we going to do to change what the world is doing, but what are we going to do to change our response? In Numbers chapter 11, there's a passage there um, that talks about Israel's attitude as they're on their way to the promised land. In Numbers 11 and verse 5, particularly, um, you've probably heard this passage. Uh, they are... Um, they've just left Mount Sinai and they're headed north up to Kadesh Barnea where they will go in uh, and spy out the land and could have gone in and taken the land. Now, of course, they did not succeed in that. They uh, failed to have faith in God and so wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But nevertheless, coming back to Numbers chapter 11, as they're on their way, they're, they're getting tired of the manna. They've been eating the manna for nearly a year now and they just want something else. And it says in verse 5, it says, We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, uh, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Now, that word free there is interesting since they were in bondage, but, but maybe the flow of the, fresh, of the fish was free. Maybe the, the food did taste better. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to quibble with their assertion. But I think this is one of the places where a lot of people, as we're reading through the story, we just shake our heads and we just it just boggles the mind how foolish they could be to complain. Here's God providing for them along the way. He's taking them from bondage into a land of promise, and all they can do is complain. Well, let's be careful before we cast the first stone, as it were. It's not I'm not saying that they're not wrong, but Perhaps we are closer to that reality than we realize. Um, this is not something that I think we would deal well with. These are folks who have left the security of shelter and food and gone out into the wilderness and have been living in tents for nearly a year and have been eating the same food morning, noon, and night. And here, they're just tired of it, and they, they want what they've been used to. They want to just go back. It wasn't great, but it was better than this. And I think what we would say is what they've forgotten is what lays ahead. They've forgotten about the promised land, and indeed, they had forgotten about the promised land. But brethren, we're on our way to a promised land, and we've been a few weeks I know it seems like a year. Somebody said the other day, it's been a long year this week. And that's that feels about right. It, it has been some very long weeks, but, they, but it's just weeks. Can you imagine going through what we're going through right now for a whole year? I think then we can begin to appreciate how frustrated the Israelites are. Notice where their frustration is pointed. And ultimately, we don't need to act like people who forget that we are on our way to a promised land and that whatever frustrations we're experiencing right now, hey, we've got, we've got glorious things that await us. We want to act like we have glorious things, like our treasure is indeed in heaven. Along those lines, where are you finding your joy and your peace right now? Um, when we look at Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8. There is a, a passage there regarding the manna that Jesus quotes. Moses is, is telling the people, is reminding the people when God gave them manna. And one of the things that God wanted to teach them is that man lives uh, not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And of course, you remember Jesus quoting that to Satan as he was being tempted there in the wilderness. What do we take from that? I think one of the things we take from that is that the manna was not supposed to be the source of comfort. 
We talk a lot about comfort food. Manna wasn't comfort food. Manna was sustenance. Manna was getting them through the day. It was getting them the energy that they needed to continue uh, on their journey, uh, their prolonged journey toward the promised land. But these people wanted comfort in the food. God says, that's not where it is. I want your sustenance to be me. God says, I want you to come to my words. I want that to be the thing that you thrive on. That's what drives you. Not not good tasting fish and cucumbers. No, don't worry about that. Just eat, eat what you need to eat to get up in the day and move on. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't enjoy food. God's given it to us to enjoy. He even refers to the promised land as a a land flowing with milk and honey. That's part of the promise in in that particular case. But where are you going to sort of calm your nerves right now? What brings you back down and just says, all right, I can regroup now? Is Is it getting online and scrolling through and finding humor online to get you through this? finding some entertainment to distract you in all of this? Is it food that you're going to for comfort? There's nothing wrong with finding enjoyment in any of those sources. I certainly do that as well. But I think one of the things that we need to look at is when God's word is offered, do we look at that and say, that's it? If I didn't have all, if I had to get up and eat white bread three times a day throughout all of this crisis, that wouldn't matter so long as I have God's word. Do we feel that way about it? Is that is that the thing that offers us peace? Right now, my social media feed uh, is full of opportunities to study God's word. Do I look at those and say, I need that right now? And I, I know a lot of people do think that way. But if we think well, I better do that, but I can't wait to get that over with so I can go to the thing that really comforts me, Netflix or, or YouTube or, or whatever it is that, that is sort of satisfying us right now. Do you have a hunger for God and for his word? David says in Psalm 16 and verse 5 that the Lord is his portion. He says, it is my inheritance. It's God is what I want. God is the thing that satisfies me. Let everything else go. Make sure that God is the thing. That's where his joy comes from. And so I hope that you're having an opportunity right now to look and and see really to sort of examine, to ask that question. Because a lot of our treasures have been taken away. And so it's a good chance, it's a good opportunity to ask that question. Am I sure that God is my treasure, that heaven is where my treasure lays, that that's where my heart is? Um, Well, another question, final question that we'll ask today. And that is, is life on pause for you right now? It is for a lot of people, and it is for us in a lot of ways. Uh, Certainly, there's a lot of things that we want to be involved with that we're not able to be involved with right now. There may be some goals that we want to pursue that we're not able to pursue right now. And I think that that's okay, certainly. Um, Maybe you've got career goals, not able to pursue career goals right now. Maybe you have academic goals and you've had to set those to the side or at least pause those uh, pursuits for now, and that's fine. And, and in fact, uh, I think that's, it's just the situation that we're in. But I, I want to ask you, do, do you think that all of life is on pause right now? If heaven is our goal, not only is it not on pause, but it, it has not even slowed down our pursuit to heaven. As Paul puts it in Romans chapter 13 and verse 11, he says, we're closer now than when we believed. We're closer every single day. And so we don't have, we don't have time to say, uh, we'll, we'll pick that back up when this crisis gets over. We're saying that about a lot of things. We'll just, we'll pick that up when all of this is past. Brethren, there is never, it's, there's never a time to put this down. There's never a time to pause our pursuit of Christ. Any time that we do, what we're doing is actually backing up. And we need to recognize that. 
far from putting our spiritual goals on pause, what we need to do is see this as an opportunity, a particular opportunity for growth. In James chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul, um, James starts out there, and a lot of people have used this verse during this time, count it all joy, uh, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect work so that you may be complete, thoroughly equipped, and lacking in nothing. Brethren, there's a progression there. When we go into uh, a, a trial, he says, here, if you meet that with, with a godly mindset, there's growth that occurs. You end up at the end of that crisis closer to God than when you went into it. Don't, isn't that the, the thing we want more than anything, is to end up closer to God? Uh, going a little bit farther on that, if you look over at 1 Peter chapter 4, in 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter says, beginning in verse 9, uh, beginning in verse 7, rather, the end of all things is near. Now, there's some people using that language uh, in this current crisis. I'm not going to, to use that language here, but, uh, but, but what if it was? I mean, what if we could say that? We could say the end of all things is near or here. What do we do? Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers up a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Brethren, it's not the end of the world, at least uh, as so far as we know it could be, but we don't know that. But we feel like maybe it is sometimes, people talking about it like it is. Even if it were, Peter says, here's what you ought to be doing. You ought to be getting your mind focused on God. You ought to be focusing your mind on prayer. You ought to be focusing your mind on how you can love one another and how you can how you can exercise what gifts you have, what, what abilities, what talents, your resources, and using those for God's good work. And so, no, by no means do we set it down and say uh, life is on pause. In fact, I think one of the opportunities is because so many other pursuits are, are, are having to be set aside right now, it, it could clear a path and we say, now I see more clearly where I'm headed. Now I see more because other things are put on pause. The one thing that matters most in my life. And I hope that we can look at this moment like that and we can learn in this moment like that. Well, let me leave you with this. I mentioned this earlier. Let's not be passive in our response. You and I, we can't change really anything about what's going on right now at a decision level. Maybe you think that some of the um, quarantine should be lifted. Uh, maybe you think it should be uh, more strict. Uh, maybe you think some of the things that they're doing to help the economy are not enough. Maybe you think it's too much and they should stay out of it. Well, I, can, I can guarantee you this. Uh, I don't think anybody watching this video is going to be in any of those decision-making roles. And in fact, I think none of us are going to even be consulted about those decisions. I can't imagine a single leader right now looking over your or my Facebook or Twitter feed and stopping at something we post and going, oh, I hadn't thought of that. No. What we can do is actually only control our response. We can control how we're reacting, how we're thinking, how we're using this time. Everything else, we've got to leave to the people who actually have a role uh, in making those decisions. And ultimately, of course, leave it in the hands of God. But 
what I want us to recognize is this is not a time to set down our responsibilities. It's not a time to set down our spiritual goals. It's a time even to to increase those goals, to increase our focus at the very least on those goals. And so I hope that you're encouraged to do that. I hope that you're encouraged to see opportunity in the midst of crisis, in the in the midst of chaos, and and that that will be one of the sources of peace. That you recognize, hey, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen to my job. I don't know what's going to happen to my retirement. I know what's happening to my eternity. So that's the thing that I'm going to keep drawing near. That's where I'm going to invest, uh, if you will. Well, again, there are so many things that we could say about where we're at, about what we're uh, going through right now. These are just some thoughts that I've had over the last week, some things that I'm trying to implement uh, for myself and my, my house. I hope that as the week goes on for you, that even if there's lots of life goals that are being set to the side, being put on pause for you, that you'll recognize that the ultimate goal shouldn't even, your pursuit of the ultimate goal shouldn't even slow down. I hope that you recognize um, that you recognize that there is a, a, a great hope in the midst of hopelessness. So many people are despairing right now. The thing that we're going after, it hasn't moved. It hasn't shifted. It's in the same place it always was because God does not shift. I hope then, finally, that you recognize that this, God's Word, it is not a book that is there to get you through the hard times. It is not a book that is there for people who are going through good times. It's a book for every time. And so it's not that, that I'm saying, well, now we need the Bible. No, we needed the Bible last week and we needed it a month ago. But maybe, maybe right now we realize more of how much we need it every day. And I hope that your focus will be drawn to that. And I hope that you will find the peace that passes understanding through a greater knowledge of him and drawing nearer to him. Now, it may be you're watching this and you don't know what that means. You don't know what it means to draw near to God. You don't know even how to get started in in studying his word. If there's any way that we can help you, I hope that you will, um, that you'll communicate with us. You can do so through uh, the YouTube page that this video is posted on. You can visit our website and find phone numbers and email addresses to get in touch with us. We'd love to study with you um, and answer any questions. We'd love to help you draw near to God. Thank you for taking the time to come to us and uh, come to this study today and join in uh, with us. And I hope that it's been beneficial to you.